my pleasure uh, to introduce the next speaker, Isaac Sevanyana um, from pu Public Health uh, uh, Laboratories in Uganda. He directs. Um, we were early on involved. We have an existing collaboration between SEND and Makerere University in Uganda. We teach a summer course every year. Um, and we were involved uh, thanks to you know, some faculty at UC Berkeley um, very early checking in with our Ugandan collaborators and friends and um, trying to see how we can support building testing capacity because for a global pandemic, I think it is important to keep in mind that um, you know, new strains can emerge all the time. It's really a global problem, even if we were able to solve things in a perfect way in the US or in other countries, um, ultimately no one is safe until everybody is safe um, because you know, ultimately you need to get rid of the virus everywhere. So with that, I'd, I'd, I'd love to introduce Isaac Sevanyana who has led um, the national effort in Uganda um, for providing diagnostic testing capacity against the novel pathogen. Welcome, Isaac. Yeah, thank you, uh, Julian. Yes, I'll be sharing the experience we've had in Uganda with the COVID. Uh, it has been a challenge uh, globally, and uh, we relate with all the, uh, the, the bottlenecks that came with uh, testing with COVID. Especially that uh, PCR is not a normal test that you use in a routine uh, clinical management of patients, but it's a tool we normally find in uh, research labs, and it happened to be the main tool that we needed to use uh, for COVID testing. Um, just a, a quick background for uh, those who may not be familiar in Uganda, uh, with Uganda. We are situated in the Eastern part of Africa. Uh, the population of Uganda is about 47 million people and uh, just 25% uh, of the population is urban, but even with the urban population, people um, move into the towns and cities uh, for work and, and they retract back in the evenings uh, into their uh, uh, rural homes. So the population is uh, relatively young, uh, an average age of uh, 16. And I think uh, these factors had to, a role to play with how COVID played out in Uganda. Uh, if you compared Uganda with other countries in Africa, Uganda's testing was relatively good. And that's thanks to the partnership that we've had, especially uh, with the, uh, uh, the US through agencies like CDC, USAID, uh, SEED and other uh, partners from the US, but also the Global Fund. Uh, they have greatly contributed to uh, the testing uh, 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 success in, in, in Uganda. Uh, looking at the picture of COVID, uh, uh, we've been relatively lucky that uh, 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 even at the peak uh, of the wave that we had in November, uh, we picked at 800 uh, um, uh, cases uh, per day, and we've seen that uh, 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 we, we've seen that wave uh, retract to the very low infections. Uh, uh, it's important to note here that the testing was not uh, we we just like many other African countries, we weren't uh, testing uh, intensively as it has been in the US or, or, or Europe or uh, like the kind of testing we're seeing in uh, South America right now. We are testing relatively lower numbers. So we must have missed uh, uh, many more infections. Uh, but uh, the little testing we managed to do, we were leveraging already on existing systems, especially the systems built uh, 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 along the HIV and TB uh, reference service delivery, and also uh, taking advantage of the research labs and the collaborations uh, that had a PCR uh, testing capacity. We have seen fewer deaths, 
And uh, this has been mainly because of uh, uh, the political leadership. We've had a strong political leadership uh, that enforced uh, 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 stringent measures, uh, control measures. Like we went into lockdown even before we registered 10 cases of COVID in the country. And we've had uh, strict border testing uh, for the uh, truck drivers who are allowed to continue uh, transacting, uh, Uganda being a, a landlocked country. We needed cargo to continue moving. So uh, even with those populations, we had uh, testing. We did a lot of uh, trace, uh, contact tracing um, um, in the early days of the epidemic. And uh, those that were found uh, to be uh, positive were put in institutional uh, isolation or quarantine centers. So I think uh, those uh, contributed greatly to seeing a fewer numbers of COVID cases in Uganda. And uh, also I think uh, the population structure being relatively young population and uh, the low urban urbanization, I, I think also contributed to uh, the play out of COVID in Uganda, at least uh, during the last 12. Uh, lately, we are seeing a gradual increase in the numbers and we are, we are preparing for the next surge uh, and activating all our uh, preventive measures and uh, increasing population awareness, but also stockpiling on the testing uh, uh, reagents. And, and supplies. So uh, when uh, COVID broke loose, uh, we quickly went into assessing uh, where we had the PCR capacity. We had relatively low PCR capacity in the country, uh, limited to a few uh, sites in the country. And uh, most of the sites were actually concentrated around Kampala. So of the 22 sites that we had, only uh, five sites were actually uh, uh, offering clinical services. And the others were uh, about where uh, research uh, sites. And uh, of those sites, only three sites were ready to start testing as of uh, May, uh, as of April 2020. Um, when we started the testing. So we had to uh, do a, a assessment of the gaps of the other gap of the other labs and uh, had a plan of uh, fixing the existing gaps and also preparing the research labs to uh, offer clinical laboratory testing. So we started with uh, just the three labs to test, but we have now scaled up to uh, uh, many more labs uh, that are offering testing as I'll show. So uh, also uh, the other tool that was very useful to us uh, was the uh, National uh, Sample Transport Network. So this is a referral system that we have built along uh, the HIV with the support uh, from PEPFAR uh, through CDC, DOD and USAID. And uh, how it works is that we mapped all health facilities around the big health facilities in the different uh, districts in the country. So we have up to 100 hubs. So each hub serves uh, around uh, uh, 40 health facilities, lower health facilities within a radius of uh, 30 to 40 kilometers around that hub. So. Uh, the hub is equipped with uh, bike riders, those who have been in Kampala, the Tukutuku or border borders. So they are able to, uh, uh, to transact between the hub and the lower health facilities on a scheduled routing. And uh, each health facility is visited at least uh, uh, twice a week. And they're able to uh, collect samples from the lower health facilities to the hub and then uh, from the hub, the tests that are not offered at the hub are transported by uh, either the, the poster courier system or we have lately added uh, uh, vans that now transport the samples from the hub 
uh, to the Central uh, Public Health Lab, which is like the, the, the national hub. And then from the Central Public Health Lab, they were able to distribute the samples to the respective uh, uh, reference lab, uh, uh, specialized labs that do the testing. So this has allowed us to connect over three, close to 3,000 health facilities across the country. And in this network, we're able to transact up to 3 million tests every year until COVID uh, struck. So when COVID struck, we're able to leverage on this system, but we needed to expand it because uh, uh, COVID came with uh, non-traditional uh, health facilities, uh, facilities like uh, the, the, the border points of entry, uh, of entries uh, and, and and so we had to uh, add more vehicles and also the frequency at which we needed to transport our uh, COVID samples uh, was uh, relatively faster. So we had to increase the, the, the routes that the cars make between uh, the hubs and, and, and Kampala. And also the bike riders, the route, the, the, the frequencies they visit the health, lower health facilities. Uh, we also took advantage of the information systems. We're in the process of building a national health information system that is able to connect the lower health uh, facilities. Uh, right now in Uganda, everywhere you are, you can at least access internet through the mobile uh, phone uh, networks. So we're using that platform to try and uh, uh, build information systems uh, through our hub networks and the lower health facilities. We have all the hub, net, uh, the hub uh, facilities connected to the national uh, information management system. So we also use this platform to allow us to quickly collect data and uh, uh, transmit results for COVID. And also it quickly helps us to put up a reporting mechanism that allowed us to keep track of the COVID numbers on a daily basis. Um, we had to uh, uh, put up a lab uh, a manual to allow uh, standardization and coordination of, uh, of, ma of management of the COVID testing. And uh, uh, in this manual, we had to, uh, to, to, to provide guidance on how, which kind of uh, technologies we had uh, adopted for COVID testing, uh, uh, S relevant SOPs uh, in, in that case, we had to uh, uh, give guidance on the safety and the biosafety measures that health workers needed to take, uh, with the minimum P PPE they needed to use at which uh, uh, activities. And uh, we also had to uh, provide the uh, uh, SOPs for how samples are collected, transported, and, and how results are returned to, to, uh, to, to back to the health facilities. And we also provided guidance on how to do quality assurance, equipment management, uh, the quantification and management of stocks. So we, we had a really elaborate uh, coordination uh, uh, mechanisms that even allowed us to uh, keep track of the weekly uh, volumes of samples in each lab, the, the kind of uh, stocks they had, how long that stock would last. And we had to direct uh, reagents and stocks to the different labs and also divert samples to avoid uh, labs going off the grid due to a uh, stock out. Um, we also developed a mechanisms of uh, training and uh, 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 bridging gaps that laboratories had and, and uh, training and, uh, and activating labs, especially that when we had to use uh, lab uh, uh, research labs, they weren't, uh, 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 they didn't have the different components that would allow them to do uh, clinical testing. So we developed an assessment tool that we gave these labs to do assessment, and then we would score the labs according to how they, they, they performed on the assessment tool as low risk, medium, and high risk. And we targeted the low risk labs, closing their gaps because they had minimal gaps. And we had them trained 
we uh, use the, the first set of uh, positive samples to develop a proficiency some, uh, a panel and would have them do the testing. And then once uh, they pass the panel, would activate them for testing. And through this, we managed to bring on labs in a coordinated way on the grid and uh, ensuring that we're offering uh, quality testing uh, through the, the, uh, the epidemic. Um, so the COVID test really became a defined business. People needed to travel, they needed a COVID test cargo transacting across, in, across borders, uh, needed to have a COVID test. So it looked like a business needed to be my, uh, defined, uh, was defined by, uh, by, by the COVID test. So as the numbers built up at a rate at which we were not building the testing capacity, and, and then we also suffered uh, uh, lots of uh, stock, stock outs of the different uh, supplies, sample collection materials or lab reagents. Uh, um, we, 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 we ended up experiencing long queues uh, of, uh, of traffic on borders, uh, stretching as long as 50 kilometers. And uh, uh, this was really very challenging, but we had to, uh, to really fast track uh, the introduction of, uh, of, of, new, of, of new labs uh, and uh, creating labs within the vicinity of uh, the borders uh, to uh, quicken up the testing. Right now, the situation is uh, relatively good, but as infections come up and the demand for testing, um, we are likely to go into this kind of situation. So we are now also exploring use of uh, uh, antigen IRDTs as another alternative to avoid going into this kind of situation. So as we suffered the uh, 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 shortage of supplies and reagents, we needed to think outside the box. Uh, we were uh, divided between uh, having high quality results at, at the cost of uh, not testing at all. So we had to explore uh, pooled testing. Uh, pooled testing uh, is where we had to uh, combine a number of samples into one and test them as one test. And those that would test positive would go back and uh, test the individual samples uh, that are added to the pool. Uh, to identify the samples that uh, contributes to the positivity of the pool. And that way uh, it helped us to really uh, work through uh, few reagents to output a lot of tests. Like I'll, I'll, I'll show some, some examples. We also had to do a, a heat extraction as an alternative to uh, extra, uh, nucleic acid extraction especially that uh, we would have lots of uh, uh, PCR uh, master mix and primers, but we would uh, stock out on uh, extraction reagents. So that also helped us. So these methods uh, came with constraints of uh, loss of sensitivity and uh, also increased the complexity of doing uh, uh, business in the lab, but overall, uh, at least they helped us to sustain the testing. Uh, this is an example where we uh, evaluated the uh, uh, the pooling to determine uh, at what uh, up to what numbers of samples you'd pull to uh, with uh, to minimize the, the 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 effect the pooling would have on the sensitivity. Uh, so we had selected a number of samples that were positive with the different range of CT values. Uh, and then uh, we did the, the polling using those number, those samples, and then uh, we uh, determine uh, the scores of uh, this, uh, sens uh, the sensitivities uh, with increasing CT values. And in this, with this uh, method, and it was different between different methods, uh, with this method uh, of Cobas 8800, uh, we uh, uh, pulling up to five samples would allow us to just lose that uh, sensitivity by uh, 4.2%. Uh, 
which was really within the, uh, the gray zone of the detection limits of the method. And uh, this is an example of uh, how pooling was uh, actually saving us. Uh, on 9th August, we stocked out of reagents in the whole country, and uh, we didn't have reagents for uh, doing uh, COVID testing until the 12th. But during this time, uh, there were trucks stuck at the, at the borders, and we had piles of samples uh, built up in the labs, up to 7,000 samples. So on 12th, we received reagents, and uh, we did the pooling. So the reagents we received uh, uh, on 12th would have lasted for uh, just uh, five days if we hadn't pulled uh, done and uh, done pool testing. But with the pool testing, it allowed us to stretch these uh, reagents to last for at least 18 days, enough time for uh, other stocks to get into the country. And uh, we kept monitoring uh, the, 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 uh, the efficiency of the pooling uh, uh, between that uh, period of 11th August to 29th. Pooling was, uh, gave us a saving of up to 63% of the reagents would have used otherwise if we weren't pooling. And as the positivity rate increased and the number of repeats uh, increased, the, pool, the, the, the saving went down, but overall uh, there was a, a good saving. So with just one lab for just this, uh, that period of three months, we are able to save close to a million uh, US dollars worth of reagents. And if you consider all the other labs, because we adopted this strategy of pooling through, throughout our uh, networks. So if you look at the savings of all those other labs for the last nine months, we have really uh, have saved uh, lots of, uh, of reagents. So we're also, as WHO uh, authorized use of RDTs, we went into looking the RDTs. Um, we have evaluated some of them and I will show some data and we have gone ahead to uh, prepare the country to use uh, the, uh, the RDTs. So we have looked at RDTs uh, uh, as they come on the market including those that, w, that have received the WHO emergency use, uh, like a standard Q and PAN bio, and apparently they seem to be performing better. But we've also seen uh, antigen RDTs that are, are performing terribly bad. So this uh, underscores the, the importance of actually uh, 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 doing a country evaluation before adoption of uh, some of these uh, uh, tools. So the PanBio and, and standard Q evaluated using the uh, retrospective uh, testing of patients that were in isolation. They seem to be promising, although still uh, their performance is below 80% sensitivity. Their specificities were good above 90, uh, 98%. And that gives us confidence to go ahead and, and look at them in a uh, in a field trial where we, we rolled them out in uh, 30 uh, uh, districts in uh, uh, 90 health facilities and were able to collect data on uh, 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 2,800 uh, 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 cases. And uh, uh, it was able to give us uh, a performance of uh, about uh, 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 70, about 74% uh, sensitivity. It's not a great performance, and uh, that is mainly because uh, of how uh, COVID seems to be playing out in our populations. If you look at the gray uh, graph, it shows the normal distribution of the CT values of the patients that we tested positive for COVID. Uh, you may notice that uh, close to 60% of the people testing for COVID in Uganda have uh, high CT values, implying that they are presenting with low uh, viremia. So 
uh, when you look at the uh, the pink bars represents the city value uh, normal distribution of city values for those uh, that tested positive on antigen RDT and the blue represents those that tested negative on antigen RDT but were positive on the PCR. You can see that the antigens are able to detect uh, uh, they are performing well for just uh, probably 40% uh, of the population that presents uh, high CT values. And it would miss out a big proportion of patients uh, that are presenting with low viremia. So these patients may be presenting with low viremia because uh, could be that uh, biologically they are they, they, they express low viremia, or it could be that uh, uh, they present late uh, for testing, and therefore we are seeing them at their recovery end of the testing. Yeah, but this may explain why we're seeing a low uh, sensitivity despite uh, the WHO uh, evaluations uh, showing uh, higher sensitivities of these RDTs. And that's why we are trying to be very conscious how we're using the RDTs in our populations and the interpretation of the results that come from these RDTs. Yeah, we have walked this journey with uh, uh, many uh, uh, collaborators and uh, we, we are grateful for the support that we have received uh, that has an allowed uh, Uganda to respond effectively to COVID, at least uh, during the, the first uh, uh, wave that we have seen and uh, as we prepare for the resurgence, especially that the, the indications showing that uh, the, uh, we might see uh, an increase in the infections in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. Wonderful talk, a very elucidating. Congratulations uh, for setting this up so well. You know, it's impressive. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, there's one question. Can you speak about Uganda's sequencing capacity? What proportion of positive samples are sequenced at the moment? Yes, yeah, we have just uh, started uh, the sequencing uh, using the capacity we have at the Uganda Virus Research Institute. Our capacity is uh, very low. We have uh, so far done uh, sequenced uh, under 300 uh, samples. And uh, we have done sequencing, uh, uh, we've been mainly uh, surveying, uh, doing surveillance for uh, for uh, uh, positive cases that are caught at the borders of entry into Uganda. And lately we are seeing uh, uh, variants, the UK, the South Africa, and the Indian variants uh, uh, recording in Uganda. On top of the, uh, the variant that we observe, the, uh, what we call the Ugandan variant, that we observe that during uh, the peak transmission. So uh, we are working with WHO to try and expand uh, this sequencing and to be able to uh, have relatively more. So we're also uh, uh, expanding this capacity at the Makere lab um, to, to make sure that uh, we're able to have relatively good numbers of the sequencing. That's great. So what do you think was like the number one thing that held you back you know, developing testing capacity. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, it, it was mainly the PPE and the sample collection materials. Mm -hmm. Even when we could get the labs ready and we had uh, reagents in the labs, it was really a big uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, collecting samples, having enough PPE spread out uh, out, out to the country because you didn't know where the infection is going to come. And uh, uh, especially in the beginning, before we learned more about the transmission of the virus, uh, 
we, we were going for the high level PPE and uh, uh, it was really a challenge at the time when there was shortages, shortages even in the US. Right. So uh, the PPE and the collection materials actually uh, gave us a very big uh, challenge, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a bit about the regulatory environment? Because for this conference, I mean, the thing I, I found ex interesting about looking at comparing the Ugandan situation is that it seems to me that if everybody's on board in Uganda, it, it, it can get implemented very fast. Right. While in the US, it's been a lot, you know, the science, uh, scientists agree, the doctors agree, but some some things we still can't do because um, we have regulations and nobody answers the phone. <laughs> so so how can you talk a little bit about the environment there? Because clearly you've also maintained the high you know, testing standard and, um, you know, integrity of sample and labeling and so on. But it's a bit the, the system is a bit different. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the, the political environment plays a big role. Uh, uh, we had a political uh, leadership uh, uh, listening and, and, and uh, implementing uh, the scientist uh, recommendation and giving all the support that was uh, very, and, and, and mobilizing the population. So that, that was a big, big plus, although at some point they went overboard and you took advantage of the situation to advance their political interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also our history of uh, pre uh, uh, outbreak preparedness, uh, especially we around uh, building capacity to quickly detect Ebola uh, and, and uh, hemorrhagic fever uh, uh, viral infections that are very prone to break out in the Congo and, and around the uh, eastern borders of Uganda. And the experiences that we had in the last Ebola uh, epidemic uh, has kind of uh, uh, strengthened our institutional collaborations and uh, public response and institutional response to, to the epidemic. So I think it's something that uh, we have learned uh, from uh, past experience. Thank you. And then one last question from the chat. Um, what about human resources of lab staff? Uh, you know, how did you handle that? Was that a driver in building capacity? Yeah, human resource uh, was also another big challenge, especially that uh, PCR was not a common technique. Uh, we, we, we had it in, a, in specialized labs. Uh, but you needed to build a big uh, number of people, especially the labs that were testing, testing huge number of samples coming from across the countries. They worked 24 hours. So we had to quickly train uh, uh, lab technologists in uh, molecular techniques. So we had, uh, we built a mentorship program. We had one experienced person attached to uh, two to three uh, learning uh, uh, te uh, technologists. And uh, he did the mentorship. And as we measure the proficiency of the people, then we brought in other, uh, uh, other learners as we graduate these uh, ones that have become uh, proficient. And then whenever we had the lab being activated, we had to take uh, an experienced person to work with the local teams and build capacities in them. And uh, that allowed us to uh, really uh, close the gap for, uh, for human resource. We also had to recall uh, students who had gone especially through Macquarie universities and they had used their molecular techniques uh, during their, their, their degree uh, programs. So we quickly mobilized uh, those ones and they were really the very first cohorts that we used uh, to, to expand the test, uh, the testing uh, human resource capacity. Thank you. Thanks so much again for joining us from Uganda and um, really a pleasure to hear you talk today. All right. Yeah, thank you for inviting me.
Yeah, have a good evening. I may not stay the entire uh, sure. during yeah. the entire time. It's already yeah, late in Uganda. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll be following. No problem. Thank you, Isaac.